the way I frame it, if you had like three volume buttons, right? Like three volume knobs. And, you know, let's say we have one is strength and one is hypertrophy and one is metabolic. And I progressively want to stimulate, let's say one or maybe two while the other one's turned way down. So I'm slowly turning one or two of them up and, you know, basically increasing the amount of work in those two systems. And I don't touch the other one at all. And so I'm, I'm pushing up the stimulus, pushing up the stimulus, pushing up the volume of that, of that stimulus. And then when I reach a point where I have to subject my body to so much stimulus to get a response that it's going to cause a huge stress response, well, now I have the opportunity to turn one of those dials way down and then go to the other dial that's been turned off. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So uh, let's say I'm training a, a strength hypertrophy stimulus and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing it for six weeks and I'm really you know, getting better, getting stronger and getting you know, really, really efficient at this hypertrophy stimulus. And I get to the point where now for me to actually get a response, I have to work harder and harder and harder and harder every week. Well, at some point, working hard is going to be overridden by stress. Like, working hard is great, but realize the harder you work, the more stress you're creating in your body. So, you know, I call stress kind of the kill switch for muscle, right? It's important to the, to the stimulus and the response, but too much kills your, kills your progress. So once you reach a point where you feel like, gosh, I have to do a lot of work to get any results, well, gosh, turn one of those down. Let's turn the strength way down, turn it basically off. Or, or you can progress it down slowly and you can go into this other metabolic one, which is just like manipulating the density of your workouts, right? All the while trying to subject your body to the smallest amount of stimulus possible to, to achieve a novel response. So I'm not going to go from zero on, on this volume knob to seven. I'm going to go to, from zero to like a half, right? So if I haven't done a metabolic stimulus in the gym in a while, so an example of a metabolic stimulus would just be like, hey, I'm going to do one drop set or I'm going to do one combination of back-to-back -back exercises. So now that's increasing the metabolic demand of my body. So my body doesn't have time to rest between sets. So you're accumulating more metabolites. Welcome back to another show brought to you by your friends over at juve.com. Leaders in light therapy, also known as photobiomodulation, this is a tool that can optimize your body's mitochondrial function, help entrain your body's circadian rhythms, improve hormones, hair, and skin health. That's what my wife uses it for. I've shared with you in other videos that I'll link below where the Juve therapy has improved my testosterone levels. So it's a part of my lifestyle, part of my practice. In fact, a funny small side note before we get back into it with Ben is when I showed up at MI40 gym in Tampa, he was doing his Juve session. So a lot of people are implementing this photobiomodulation device using the myriad of different tools tools that Juve offers to optimize their recovery, sports performance, hormones, and skin health. So I recommend getting started with something simple like the Juve Go. This is a portable unit. It goes in my backpack whenever I'm on the road. So it's something that you can use and get started with to notice the benefits. And then should you decide that it's helpful for your specific condition, you can upgrade. They have a lot of different tools. We have one right in our bathroom, right near our bathroom that we use every single morning. It's the Juve Max Dual. So it's a great full body, full body unit that we do 10 to 12 minutes. Uh, it's every single morning. So definitely check out the website. The URL is juve.com. That's J-O-O-V-V.com for chest Mike. Again, that's J-O-O-V-V.com for chest Mike. And at checkout, use the promo code HIH and you can get some free swag and save on shipping. And then um, how'd you get into bodybuilding and, and that? By accident, um, I was 15 years old playing, or sorry, working, playing baseball and wanted to work out to get faster. And, you know, I found that every time I trained my legs, I'd get faster. So every before every game, I'd go and train my legs. At least I felt faster. Um, so it kind of became this thing where, you know, you're playing baseball five times a week. So you're in the gym an hour early before you play and, and train the legs. And I started to like it. I was like, oh, you know, I, I kind of noticed that you know, every time I work out, I get this pump. And then, you know, after a couple of weeks, the pump that I had two weeks going out kind of still there. It stays. I'm like, this is interesting. And I was terrible at it. Like I was, I was um, a vegetarian, 150, 55 pounds, like very, very skinny, not lean by any stretch, um, but no muscle. And uh, I just took a liking to it, man. I don't know why. I think it was more like I needed it. And I, and I remember, you know, seeing my first cover of Flex magazine and I was like, ugh, it's disgusting. Like, I don't want to look like that. Fast forward a few years, and I'm the guy on the cover of Flex magazine. So, um, yeah, bodybuilding was one of those things that uh, really allowed me to kind of escape the um, reality of being a fearful child. I was very much, I grew up in kind of a, an explosive, uh, with an explosively angry father, and I was very fearful, and I internalized it. Um, and bodybuilding allowed me to kind of build a, an armor to protect me, or so I thought. Mm -hmm. Do you, you've talked about that before in other podcasts I've heard with Mind Pump. Do you talk to your dad still? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's funny, in 2007, just before I got my pro card, I actually came to terms with the fact that I was okay, never talking to him ever again, and 
um, I set the intention. I said, you know what? Because I was trying to kind of, uh, you know, get all the negative people out of my life. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go today and I'm going to talk to my dad. I'm going to say, Dad, you know, I, I love you, but I appreciate you, but I never want to see you again. And um, my best friend at the time, still best friend, said, hey, man, let's talk about this. And he was an NLP practitioner. And he goes, well, I wonder if we couldn't go back and, like, change the perception of the events and maybe maybe see it from your dad's perspective. Like, so there's one specific event that I saw as kind of being the catalyst for our terrible relationship growing up. Um, he goes, well, let's go back and, like, talk to seven-year-old Ben and, and change the perception of, of his, um, you know, or interpretation of the events. Uh, so we did that, and uh, literally at the end of that NLP session, I walked up, I walked out, and I was like, wow, I don't feel the same. And I walked up to my dad with kind of the same intent. I wasn't sure how it was going to go, but, you know, you walk into any relationship where you feel any negative emotions, and that other person picks it up from you right away. So going into that conversation, I didn't have that negative attachment anymore. I didn't have that negative feeling, that negative animosity toward him. So I went in with an open heart, and I said, you know, Dad, I... I don't appreciate these things you've been doing, and I'd really like it if you could stop. And he says, okay. It has the, the most uh, calm conversation I've ever had in my life, and, and ever, to this day, like, he's now a great grad, granddad to my kids, and we've been great ever since. And, and, you know, the scary thing, I don't know if I've ever said this in public, but, like, he had never called me by my name since that day. He'd been calling me anything derogatory that you could imagine, like, the most negative, like, like scum off the bottom of my shoe kind of conversations, right? Or, or worse, <laughs> I'd never call him by my name. And he goes, well, what would you like me to call you then? And I said, well, how about Ben? Or how about son? Yeah. And he goes, okay, champ. And, he called, he called, and I was like, fine. You know, that's right? awesome. That's great. And yeah, not that that may be deep for, the, for the, the scope of the podcast, but yeah, that's how I got into it, man. It's, um, you know, a lot of trauma around uh, just being afraid of my own shadow, ultimately. And I thought bodybuilding was a cool way to look awesome, feel awesome, get hot chicks. And you know, as a teenager, that's an appealing thing. And um, I just loved it, man. I fell in love with the, the discipline. I fell in love with the uh, methodical approach to the science. I obviously got a science degree because of that, I'm sure. I think bodybuilding is the reason why I finished high school and college. I mean, I, no one in my family had ever finished those things. And uh, I think that's the reason I did it is I, I found a passion and I was able to pursue that. And had I not, who knows, I probably would have been a drug addict or alcoholic like, like everyone else in my family. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. We, that brings up a really good point. Uh, and I don't think it's too deep for this podcast at all, because I think a lot of people get into fitness for unhealthy reasons or to sure. manage emotions coping, that they can't coping make Co it's a coping yep. strategy yep. and then through that they gain mental fortitude strength yep. they see the transformation they realize like what if i can transform my body speaking of me in particular and i know this to be true for other people i can build this business approach this woman that i might be scared of yeah i can do anything yeah, yeah. so how do you like i mean it seems like it's all a growing process for a lot of people but for some people they're still just focus on the muscle, the aesthetics. Sure. The I guess the greatest learning opportunity for me was standing on stage at the Mr. Olympia contest or, or walking out to go on stage to Mr. Olympia contest, knowing that that was the most insecure I ever was. I was no more self-confident than I'd ever been. I was still that same insecure kid deep down and I had accomplished all my goals and, and well more than anybody had ever thought. And uh, I still wasn't any different than that insecure 15 or 12 year old boy. And uh, that was a very eye opening experience for me. You, you think you're going to get you're going to get there and everything's going to be great. You know, people are going to pay you. People are going to love you. You're going to feel great about yourself. You're going to be happy. And I talk about this a lot on my podcast is, um, you know, the the proverbial climbing of the mountain. Right. Every every man. I, don't, I can't speak for women, but every man certainly has some uh, in, internal desire to chase external objectives. Like we all want to acquire money, we want to acquire uh, material things, or in my case, muscle. And you get to the top of this proverbial mountain and you look around and you go, oh, it's not any different up here. You know, it's not about the view at the top of the mountain. It's the view on the way up. And, and all the people that you've heard along the way or what, you, what you've acquired, the skill set you've acquired along the way is now the person you are. And I was just very blessed to pick something that was a you know, maybe a, a productive pastime that allowed me to pick up um, habits that were conducive to me being a great person or a better person and, and also make me realize and have that in, internal dialogue with myself that, oh, I'm so grateful that I accomplished this for the person that it's made me, but it's also not what I was after. It's also not fulfilled me. So let's look now and you realize that, you know, I think the ultimate journey for every one of us is, is inside, right? Everyone looks outside of themselves for happiness and, and fulfillment and uh, it's ultimately, the journey's inside. I have that conversation with my kids at least three times a week. It's like we sit down, I sit them on my lap, and you know we talk about happiness and what is happiness to you. And you know, is happiness a new toy? Is happiness a new car? Is happiness driving a Lamborghini or living in a big house? And 
it's none of those things, right? We know that. And hopefully if I can pass that message on to my kids at a young age, uh, we can hopefully change, prevent or, or guide them away from a lot of the hardships and pain that a lot of people go through. Mm -hmm. Well, you're a very spiritually aware and mindful person. Do you think some people are continuing to chase that proverbial mountain? You know, people that oh, for sure. they keep dieting down, they keep putting on size, sure. whether it's through drugs or through... I think it's because they haven't achieved what they, what they set out to achieve, right? Like, so I was just blessed that I got to get to the top of the mountain. And so I could understand someone being uh, attached to like, well, I haven't got there yet. I have to keep going. I have to keep going. I have to keep going. Um, and to be honest, I probably would have done the same if it wasn't for my children being born. Um, you know, if you don't ach achieve the goal, like oh, I'm not a quitter, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm going to fail. Like I haven't got there yet. And when, and cause you're still chasing, you're like, I have to get there. And when I get there, everything's going to be okay. Right? Like when I get the pro card, everything's going to be better. When I win Mr. Olympia, everything's going to be better. Or when I make the million dollars or 10 million, you know, everything's going to be better. And then you accomplish it and, and you realize nothing's better. So the unfortunate reality is a lot of people don't ever get to accomplish those dreams. Um, so I was just blessed in this lifetime to uh, accomplish what I set out to accomplish and then some and be able to look back and reflect and, and hopefully be able to influence a lot of people and make people realize like it's not about the end destination, right? It's, it's about the journey. And if you can acquire the skills and, and the character traits to allow you to become a better person, a more caring human, a, a happy person ultimately on, on the inside with yourself, love yourself, forgive yourself. Forgiveness is a big part of what, what I've gone through. Um, then you know, maybe we can actually become a happy being. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you said you were blessed to get to the top of the mountain. Do you think that blessing is, is your mental approach to changing your physique and the, and the willpower and the structure and the ability to tolerate pain? Or do you think it's partly your genetics and things like that? Because putting on that much size and getting on that Mr. Olympia stage. It's, it's not one thing. It's a combination yeah. of things, right? It's the people that came into my life that allowed me to see what was necessary. It's, it's the amount of sheer uh, discontent I had with myself. Uh, it's the, the the fact that I attached to being a fat, lazy kid and being a fat, lazy person like everyone else in my family, and I didn't want to ever attach to being that way. And I remember being seven or eight years old and thinking that, like, I don't ever want to be like these people. And, and it wasn't a malicious thing. It was like, I just don't want to be that way. And it was maybe some degree of self-loathing, right? It's like... Um, like I refused to be attached to, to be called lazy. And that was my, that was my thing was, you know, as a kid, my dad called me lazy. Um, I thought I was lazy. So as soon as I started bodybuilding, I refused to let, to allow anyone I trained with to work harder than me. Like, uh, I would just, I would just do whatever it took. One more set, one more rep, I'd whatever. Do whatever it took yeah. to, to make me, myself feel support, superior. And that's obviously not a great place to live, but, uh, that was what drove me was, um, like I can't let in, I, I remember the day I walked into Gold's Gym Venice for the very first time, I actually stopped myself outside and, and looked at the place and was kind of in awe because it's the Mecca for bodybuilders. And I said to myself, the second I step over this threshold, everyone here is going to know me as the hardest working guy they've ever seen. And I attached, I anchored myself and every time I'd, I'd lived there for a long time. And every time I walked in that place, I anchored that. And I was like, today needs to be the hardest workout I've ever done. That's a blessing and a curse in itself because having attachment daily to having the hardest workout of your life, you could imagine the standard you're setting for yourself. But um, yeah, and there, there's so many lessons in that, that uh, um, it's, it's not about one thing, you know, it's, it's the, cum the accumulation of uh, all these extrinsic factors contributing to my ultimate ability to, um, to get there, you know, friends and uh, men training partners and mentors and, uh, you know, my wife, you know, a huge part of just like uh, sitting back and, and me being, hey babe, I gotta go train twice today, okay. Hey, babe, I'm not going to be able to hang out today. Okay. You know, hey, babe, I got to go travel the world for three months and, or, you know, two months and I'll be back. Okay. And, uh, like, without that, imagine the stress that would have come if it wasn't that. Like, everything, it's, it's everything had to go in line, right? And, and that's why I say I'm blessed. Mm -hmm. Do you think some people struggle to, and getting back a little bit to the aesthetics, because everyone, I mean, there's a health benefit to being lean and having muscle and all that. Do you think some people don't have that grit or they can't dig deep enough? Oh, Maybe absolutely. No, absolutely. And that, that's the factor, right? Yeah. That's what I had that nobody else had was, uh, it's, it's ultimately self-loathing. It was like, I hated myself more than everybody else did. It really is. Like if you dig deep at it, it's, um, I'm willing to work harder because I have more discontent with the way I look than you do. <laughs> Ultimately, that, that's, what, that's what drove me. I mean, there's probably guys out there who, you know, there's always the aversion of, or the, the avoidance of pain and the chasing of pleasure, right? There's obviously two perspectives. And for me, it was avoiding pain. I think for the most part, there may have been times where I was chasing pleasure. And I think that was a much happier place to be. And, and I do remember, you know, times in my career where I was like, 
actively pursuing like, oh, I can actually win this thing or I can, I'm actually looking really amazing now and actually pursuing that continuation of pleasure rather than the avoidance of pain. But for the most part, it was the avoidance of pain, man. It was, um, you know, uh, it's funny because I was known at many points for having the, the best legs in the planet, the biggest legs in the planet, you know, the nicest shape legs in the planet and sometimes the nicest shape body. And that's, you know, sounds arrogant, but that's what people told me. And I would look at myself and, and hated it, man. I, I covered up. I'd always wear pants. People are like, dude, why are you wearing pants? I'm like, yeah, you didn't just, like it. So when, when Ben Pekulski looked at his legs in the mirror, you saw him as skinny or what would you? I just didn't like the way they looked. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't like the way they looked, man. I was very insecure about it. Always wore pants. Always wore pants. That's so interesting. Uh, yep. I uh, always wore a sweatshirt in the gym. Never did I wear a tank top. Uh, the leaner I got, the more I'd cover up because then, you know, you're being judged, right? You know, everyone around you is like looking at you and they're, they're critiquing the, and you know, the bodybuilding world is the worst, right? You're looking at these guys who are the, the best human beings on the planet, the best physique on the planet, and they're not gonna look at how amazing your abs are, how amazing your pecs are, how amazing your quads are. They're gonna look at, damn, he's got small biceps, right? Like, oh, okay, so what does my brain think of? And you know, I was my own worst critic, which is why I succeeded, because you didn't need to tell me what was wrong with me, because I already told myself a thousand times. You know, I already knew what was wrong with me. And, and that's why I succeeded, because I was so obsessed. Like, we talked about it this weekend. I had a bunch of people in for camp at the gym. And, like, Ben, why did your legs look that way? I was obsessed, like, daily. <laughs> it wasn't just, like, an afterthought. Like, oh, maybe. It was like, no, no, no. Maybe it's not an option. Like, how? It's the only way. It's the only way I looked at it, man. Um, how am I going to get there? I don't care what it takes. It's going to happen. And the same thing with being Mr. Olympia, and I, I briefly brought that up, is... I would have been Mr. Olympia, no matter what it took. Um, but God blessed me with two little angels. And I'm kidding, you know, that's the, that saved my life, man. I was on this path of, I wouldn't necessarily call it self-destruction, but I certainly would have, I, I was the healthiest version a bodybuilder could be. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I, was, I was very much focused on being Mr. Olympia. And, um, you know, God sent me an angel in the form of my son, and I thought I could still continue to compete. And they sent me another angel in the form of my daughter. And... Uh, at that point, I knew I knew I was done, and I, I would have I would have continued to pursue being Mr. Olympian no matter what it took, man. I, there's no doubt in my mind I would have got it. There's no doubt in my mind. Um, but I realized at that point, as soon as my daughter was born, that there was bigger things for me in this world. I had a bigger purpose. I could impact more people by being a great human being, being a great father, being a great leader who has been through all these struggles, who has dealt with all his fears and dealt with all the the anger and forgiveness, than someone who's just you know Mr. Olympia and uh, you know, looking at Mr. Olympia contests now, like I go and I look at these people very differently than I did before, right? Before you put them on a pedestal, like these, these amazing uh, athletes, which they absolutely are. Like if you've never competed, you get a new level of respect for people. But I just look at it differently, man. I see I see the pain inside because that's where I, where I came from. Yeah. Even Kai Green's talked about that. I've heard him on uh, Gary Vaynerchuk's podcast. So, so in that era, you would have competed with Kai potentially for the Mr. Olympia title. Who else was it? Just frame of reference people. People. Yeah, so with Phil Heath, um, yeah, Phil Heath, um, you know, all the guys who are currently competing, I mean, I'm only two years removed, so uh, all the guys who are currently competing were there. Kai was there, um, you know, Cedric McMillan, uh, just after Jay Cutler, so stupid me. I, I um, qualified for the Olympia a couple times and didn't do it early in my career because I was arrogant, and I said, you know, I'm not ready to win yet, so I'm going to skip this one and do the next one, and I did that a couple times, and then by the time I was able to compete, Jay had been retired. Uh, which sucked because it would have been great because Jay was one of my idols growing up. But uh, yeah, I mean, all the all the even 2009, I think I could have competed against Ronnie Coleman. But uh, again, I call I qualified, passed it up stupidly. Um, so yeah, man, I've had uh, you know effectively all the the best bodybuilders since 2009. So uh, and if anyone's following bodybuilding, I'm not going to name everybody, but there's sure you know quite a few, a lot of great athletes. Yeah. I grew up reading those magazines, Flex Magazine, Muscular Development. Those were bodybuilding.com forums. Like in the late 90s, early 2000s, that's how I got my information. I think a lot of, for a lot of men, that's that's where we go to. Now it's it's all over Instagram. You don't even need to buy the magazines and so Which on. Which is unfortunate, right? And I talk about that because. Um, it's taken away the thought, you know, you and I can go on Instagram or YouTube and watch somebody train. Like you can watch Ben Pokolsky's legs on YouTube and you can go, well, Ben trains this way. And therefore I want legs like him. Therefore I should do the same thing. And the reality is, as we both know, you and I are not built the same way. We should do different things. And I think that the exposure to YouTube and Instagram is actually a big, big detriment in, in the fitness community because people don't think anymore. They just mindlessly act. So if you look at the, the athletes from the 70s and 80s, there's no, even 90s, there's no YouTube, there, there's no internet. So how do they learn? Well, they learn by feeling, they learn by watching. Like, hey, when I do this, 
that happens. I need to do more of that. That muscle is not developed yet. So instead of me going and watching YouTube, I'm actually going to think my way through this and actually watch what this muscle is supposed to do. So they develop a skill set. And I think that's why that's a huge problem in our world right now is people mindlessly trying to do what other people do and, and being to, to be successful. Just because of the sheer mechanics of their body is it's different. completely like different. Their femur to tibia ratio is exactly. different. Like yep. you're pointing Arm out length are different. Spine, uh, you know, torso length is different. Clavicle length is different. Sternal angle is different. Everyone's different, man. And, and the exercises that work for me will not work for you. As we saw today, like I could squat all day flat ground and get huge legs. You squat all day, you get a sore back. <laughs> that doesn't mean you can't build muscle, right? Right. Doesn't mean you can't build muscle. It just means your body doesn't like to squat in that position. So we can manipulate it to put you in a position to challenge your quads so that you can build them just as much as me. Mm -hmm. But if you just kept doing it and thinking, oh, my only choice is working. I got to work hard, man. I'm not working hard enough. Well, you'd, you'd hurt yourself. Yeah. And you'd be the type of guy who goes, oh, I just can't build that muscle because you'd, you'd pass off the ownership outside of yourself. You'd go, oh, you know, I can't do it. Bad genetics. You know, I'm not taking steroids. That guy must be taking something that I'm mm -hmm. not. Um, but it's ultimately just like, hey, your body just doesn't move that way. If we learn how to move it correctly, it's a different scenario. Yeah, good point. I definitely want to dive into that. But before I forget, you were talking about your legs and how they were in insecurity. Uh, a lot of people would think that genetically your legs were like your, your strong point. But how would you feel about that? What, Man, I'll tell you what, the thing that drove me, and this is why I had the best legs in the world, If I mean, uh, that's not my statement, that's other people's statement, I, I wouldn't think I would, um, is because I remember being 18 years old and, and uh, telling one person who I looked up to very much, it was actually one of my mentors at work, I was a personal trainer, I said, you know, I want to be a professional bodybuilder, I just decided. And he goes, dude, don't do not do that. And I go, why not? And he goes, you can't, man. You just don't have the genetics for it. It's like you have no sweep in your quads and your delts are too small. It's like your, your clavicles are too narrow. And that's all I remembered. And if anyone knows my career as a professional bodybuilder, I was known for having the yeah. best the best quad sweep and the biggest delts. Yeah. And, and that was an obsession. And I would do that. it plays in the back of my mind. Like, and the, the other thing was, one of, you know, five years later, one of my um, bosses at work again said, you'll never have striated glutes. You're not willing to suffer. I was like, okay. <laughs> That's how my brain works. It's like, the, you won't do that. I'm like, okay. Here we go. <laughs> I'm going to do it. I'm going to yeah. do it all really well. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, since you mentioned striated glutes, is it possible to get, for a, a woman or a man, striated glutes naturally drug-free? Yeah, for down? sure, for okay. sure, for sure. Um, yeah. I've got a lot of guys, athletes who are drug-free uh, striated glutes. It's not going to be fun. It's not going to be comfortable. But it's absolutely possible. And, and, and the root of all transformation is muscle contraction, right? And people miss that. People think they get on the cardio machine, they restrict their calories, they're going to burn they're gonna burn calories or they're going to you know, get lean. It's absolutely not the case, right? All, cardio is ultimately the least efficient way of burning fat. And ultimately, if you're not really, really good at muscle contraction, it's really hard to get really lean. So any advice for anybody listening is like, you got to get good at aggressive muscle contractions. And, you know, that rather than these like fluttery, soft contractions that kind of feel like I'm contracting a little bit versus like an aggressive hard contraction on every inch of the rep, right? It's not just like in one particular position, oh, I can kind of feel that muscle. It's like, no, if I want to burn calories, if you think about from an efficiency perspective, let's say average person contracts 20 to 30% of their muscle fibers per contraction, arbitrary number. Uh, but if you could push that to 30, 40, 50% of the muscle fibers per contraction, now all of a sudden it's way more calorically demanding, way more muscle damage. So there's going to be a metabolic, greater metabolic demand. And that's, that's the ultimate, um, should be the ultimate desirable uh, result for people, right? It's like, how can I get better at contracting? Which doesn't necessarily need to mean I need to build muscle. I can I can still, ultimately, you are going to be building muscle, but it doesn't need to be a visual appearance of building muscle. It's just going to be less intramuscular fat and, and better, you know, fat to muscle ratios. Why do you think people are so averse to that? Like, they, they gravitate towards the treadmills, the ellipticals, the stair well, stepper. It's ignorance, man. It's ignorance. It's, it's because people see research that says, well, during cardio, I burn a greater percentage of fat. And that's absolutely true. But if you want to build, if you want to burn maximum fat, muscle is, is what's necessary. Like why, you know, if you walk through the process, well, why do we get on a treadmill? Ultimately, we get on to burn calories. Well, what burns calories? Uh, you know, getting my heart rate up in the, in the target fat burn zone. Well, what gets your heart rate there? Contracting muscles. So if you're doing it in a really inefficient way, like walking on a treadmill or, or whatever it is, it's going to do it. It's just nothing is less efficient. And the unfortunate reality with cardio is the more you do, the less response you get. So uh, that's why it doesn't work. With weight training, the more you do, the better response you get, right? So in, in, there's obviously a point of diminishing returns. But um, the, the unfortunate reality with cardio is if I have to do 60 minutes every day or two hours every day, then your, your body literally goes, oh, that's too much stress for me. I'm not going to do, I'm not going to release this fat. I'm going to hang on to this. And you, you know the exact mm -hmm. you know, mechanisms. mechanisms. Yeah. Yeah. 
Such a great point. I mean, talking about working out efficiency, you had an email about how CrossFit recently, yeah. how CrossFit is very inefficient. These yeah. people that look, especially the women, I think they look very muscular, big traps, sure big arms, yeah, but they're training. But terrible shoulder pain, right? Uh, you see, you just, well, you see, you see yeah. they're, they're all like this forward from shoulder, shoulder mm. roll. That's not, I'm not offending any CrossFit people, but it is, right? They're very dominant here. The pec minor is very, very tight. So they have the kind of a anterior roll of, of the shoulder girdle. Yeah, but uh, I totally see that. They're all jacked up from yeah. pressing above their head. Right. And, but it's not an efficient workout because they're, you were saying, because it's um, the amount of volume that you need to, to get that stimulus is, is very high. Yeah. So, I mean, I always say if your only um, opportunity to get more result is working harder and harder, you're in big trouble because you're going to cause injuries, especially if the movement patterns aren't perfect. So uh, I always suggest that everyone works smart before they work hard. Let's let's objectively, and we, we did this today, right? Like, is it about moving load? No, it's about challenging muscle. And that's a very different thing. So in CrossFit, my objective is I need to complete this exercise or I need to move this weight. That's an external goal, right? And that's something outside of my body that gives me a good external goal. That can be useful. But objectively, if I'm trying to build muscle or challenge muscle to improve my body composition, well, it doesn't matter what I do on the outside, except if it has that internal response. What's the internal response I'm after? Well, I want to challenge muscles. So well, how do I challenge muscles? Is it is it with arbitrary movement or is it with like actually directly challenging? What does this muscle do? What, what is the, the function of this muscle? And how do I directly challenge that? That's the thought process people need to have rather than just a complete. So I always frame it around contraction rather than completion or challenge rather than completion, right? I'm not objectively trying to complete this repetition. I'm not trying to complete this exercise. I'm trying to challenge a muscle, change a paradigm, right? Um, so when things get hard in exercise, what do people do? They go faster because they try to use acceleration to, to overcome it. They try to use momentum or they try they start, they swing to try to not use muscles, right? Your body is built to use as few muscles as possible. Like I want to be as efficient as possible, using as little as possible and burning as few calories as possible. That's how we've evolved. So now if we want the opposite of that, meaning we want to be ultimately inefficient and use one muscle and challenge it, that requires severe conscious attention to details. Yeah, such a great point. Um, I mean, I see the form breaks down oftentimes in CrossFit workouts or even with powerlifting. It's meant to, it has to, right? Yeah, because you're doing, you know, what, I mean, what do you think, the, like doing 50 repetitions of a deadlift or 25 repetitions of a deadlift or squat, because these are Olympic movements involving multiple muscles. I and mean, at a certain po a point, do you think that injury is going to be there? I mean, some people can get away well, with it. This is why I say you have to work smart before you work hard. So if, you, if you're someone who's reached unconscious competence, meaning I could do an exercise without thinking about it, my body just knows how to do it perfectly. It never even, like if I tried to go out in the gym and cheat, I don't even know how. Like I've literally tried, I can't even physically do it. My body can't do it. So if I've reached the point where my body can do a squat or a deadlift with like perfect execution and, and cheating just doesn't really happen, then by all means, then now we can work hard, right? But if it's something that's kind of, um, you haven't reached that ability to execute that movement and it's just some arbitrary exercise that some CrossFit person is throwing at you or some, not even CrossFit, but anything like, you're going to break because your body is designed to cheat. Your body is designed to compensate. When some muscle starts to fatigue, your body goes, oh, shit, let's misadjust our mechanics a little bit, make something else is able to assist and, and complete this motion because your brain says external focus, complete this motion. Whereas if we create an internal focus, which is a muscular focus, right? You know, it's, it's muscle centric versus movement centric. So I'm going to create a muscle centric focus to challenge muscles. But so, yeah, to answer your question, ultimately injury is inevitable. And I always say, you know, the, the uh, reality of life is before 30, we train with our balls and after 30, we train with our brain because you have to, right? Before 30, you just, you just work. You're like, I'm just going to work hard. And then by the time you're 30, arbitrary number again, but you're like, oh, geez, I better, that kind of hurts when I do mm -hmm. that now. <laughs> Recovery is not the same. Yeah, I can do things a little bit differently now. So yeah, yeah it's very, very different. Interesting. You know, I, I do think on Instagram, one cool thing, uh, I mean, there's many beneficial aspects oh, of social media and stuff yeah. like that, but seeing more younger women do deadlifts and squats and, and stuff like that, I think it's inspiring this mindset shift in a lot of women yeah we have a lot of female viewers I, and listeners I think, I think it's great and uh, I also in inspire or I also suggest I was inspire is not the correct word but I suggest that every one of those people starts paying attention to how an exercise fits your body because um, the unfortunate reality is if we get young listeners or young females or any age females or, or males doing um, doing exercises that don't fit their body like we did today like you're going to squat and you're going, yeah, it really hurts my back. Or I'm not really getting the same results as that other girl is. Well, does that mean you can't build muscle? No. It just means the exercise may not fit you the way you want it to fit you. So let's figure out how to make your body accomplish the objective we're trying to accomplish. So if you're trying to build bigger glutes or if you're trying to build bigger quads, 
Well, that's a specific objective. That doesn't necessarily require deadlifts. That doesn't necessarily require squats. Doesn't require anything except challenging that muscle. So that's the paradigm, right? Is is it's a blessing that these people are doing it, but it's also potentially you know their biggest curse because if if there's someone who gets hurt or can't build muscle, now they're discouraged, right? Now they're going to pull the ownership outside of themselves. And go, I don't have the genetics, or I don't have her ability, or she's doing something I don't know. And I encourage everyone to take internal ownership for this, like extreme ownership, you know, to use Jocko's term, and realize you can, you absolutely can, but you need to learn how to do it for you. Well, I think that's pretty hard for people to do unless sure. they take your workshop. I mean, sure. or yeah. you have a book and you have courses and stuff like that to help people. But yeah. you know, a lot of trainers and and I was an NASM and A certified trainer when I first graduated uh, college. Um, there's not a lot of the customization. I mean, we talk about periodization. Because it's hard. It requires thought. It's not something you can do cookie cutter and put in a book, right? Like I've been fortunate enough to be teaching for a really long time, so I can kind of teach standardized approaches to like, hey, if your body looks like this, do this. And, and so I literally teach a thought process, right? Like rather than going, hey, man, you should do a bench press for chest. Well, who? Like I could do a bench press and get massive pecs. You do a bench press, you get sore shoulders. Why? Well, because we were built differently, right? Um, so that's the thing that people are trying to teach. They're trying to teach cookie cutter. They're trying to teach, hey, bench press is good for chest. Rows are good for back. Squats are good for the quads. It's all bullshit. It's not true, right? For who? And because, I mean, I could show you probably 80% of the population of males and females do a flat bench press and hit little to no chest or they're hitting, it's an upper chest exercise. And most people go, what do you mean inclines upper chest? No, it's not. Inclines a shoulder exercise for most people. And I can show you definitively, which I show you in my videos on YouTube or uh, in my, my member site. So yeah, man, it's, um, I mean, you have to think your way through it. So, the, you know, the one thing I say as soon as anybody walks into my classroom is I say, forget everything you think you know about exercise. Like, forget bench presses are for chest, forget squats are for legs. Like, forget all that stuff. Forget everything you think you know. And think. Think. Like, what does this muscle do? Every muscle has two ends. And, and where does it originate? Where does it insert? And then how do I challenge that? And that's the simplicity of it. It's so simple. But our paradigm is backwards. Our paradigm is, is mistaken around exercise-centric focus. Like, because, you know, we grew up as athletes, and it's all, I need to run faster, I need to jump higher, I need to, to you know, score more goals, whatever it is, lift more. Um, and that's great growing up, but if you're objectively trying to improve your body, it's a completely different focus. Such a good point. And which one of your courses would you recommend for so people can understand, like if they have a longer femur or torso? So I get into that um, pretty extensively for, for all body parts and, and all body types in hypertrophy mastery. So hypertrophymastery.com. Uh, hypertrophy is muscle building. Um, and uh, obviously mastery is just your body. And, and that term kind of scares some people off. But ultimately, if you want to build the, even a half decent body, you should probably think about becoming a master of your body. And it's a pretty cool thing that I talk about all the time. It's like riding a bicycle, man. Once you get the skill, you have it for life. Like alert, like dribbling a basketball. You, you learn how to dribble, you got it for the rest of your life. And, and most people, if you learn how to do these exercises, you have it for the rest of your life. And I frame it around a very small number of exercises. That's, I think that's another thing people do wrong in exercises. They try for the novel approach to exercise so much. Um, we'll get good at a very small number of things first, like one, two exercises. Get really, really good at those to where you're a master. And then slowly we diversify our skill set, right? So in hypertrophy mastery, there's like five exercises per body part. And like the ones that I think everyone should be good at as foundational exercises, you know, I call them the core 40. And um, get good at those. Get really good. And, and then you're generating stimulus to the muscle. You're generating output for that muscle. You're burning more calories. And now I can go do those other novel exercises that maybe my body understands how to contract. Right. Once you understand the movement, like, like yeah. we were doing hamstring curls, uh, we can cut to some footage of that. But like, you know, I was telling you, my back always hurts after this. And you were like, because you were doing it wrong with your hips and, and not neutralizing the spine. Um, along those lines, I, you've seen this on Instagram too. Everyone's interested, at least females growing their booty, right? Booty gains and all that. And there's a lot of bands being used, like high volume, high repetition, kind of low weight. Sure. It, and it seems like if I want to build my chest, I'm not going to do high repetition. I'm going to do kind of lower weight, you know, higher higher weight, lower again, rep. Again, that whole paradigm, and this is, again, is something that will be a paradigm shift for people, is I really believe that reps and sets and volume and load are irrelevant until you've mastered the foundation of exercise, which is like making sure that when I pick this weight up, the tension is actually going to that one muscle I want to go to, go to right? Like it, it, the manipulation of sets and reps cannot matter if the repetition hasn't been, hasn't been standardized. So if, if the actual amount of load going through that muscle or tension going through that muscle is different on every rep, 
how can I quantify what I'm doing? I can't, right? So like, oh, you're going to do three sets of eight and I'm going to do three sets of six and those are supposed to be different. Well, what if they're not? What if they're exactly the same because your body's using less and less? The heavier the weight gets, your body's using less and less of that muscle. So I think it's important that people stop focusing on, you know, the, the, what I call like the tactics, the sets and reps and volume and stuff, and first standardize their execution so they've ultimately mastered the, the contractile ability of their muscle as a, as a base foundation. That's a good tip. And is it necessary to go to failure on every set? If you're, if you're doing it right, feeling the well, muscle? Well, I actually advocate for most people to not go to failure okay. until it's, you've reached unconscious competence, right? Because yeah. like what happens at failure? Overcompensating. You cheat. Yeah. You cheat. So I write something called the Primer Program, which is like a six-week program to prime your muscles to be able to do these exercises. So we find different ways to challenge muscles. So rather than challenging it with with um, you know muscular fatigue in one set, we'll challenge it with uh, manipulation of, of combinations of exercises. So it can be combining non-competitive muscles. So you may train chest and hamstrings together. So it's not going to detract from your ability to do another one. And so we made you know if you can pick a weight to do, you could do for ten. We may do it for six. And stop there and make sure every rep is perfect. And then every week for six weeks, we, we manipulate the stimulus, but it's more or less the same kind of stuff, just like teaching your nervous system how to do these things, right? Repetitive stress. Um, so I think that's really, really important um, that, that everybody acknowledges that, you know, forced repetitions and going to failure is absolutely a part of muscle building, but when is very, very important that nobody acknowledges. So for a beginner, going to failure is probably one of the dumbest things you can do because your body doesn't have the ability to stabilize at that point. Your body's going to cheat and you develop bad habits and then your ability to build muscle gets worse. Your body gets better at compensating. You don't want to compensate, right? You're, the more you, you work hard, quote unquote, the more your body compensates. Such a good point. Um, let's talk about like pre and post workout nutrition. Sure. Have you had breakfast yet today? No. And then, so we, for you, that workout was like a, on a relative perceived exertion, what, like a six? What we did? A little bit less. A little bit less, yeah. yeah. So well, just, just the amount of work, yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. The amount of volume. Yeah. The amount of volume yeah. and, and the weights and stuff like that. Yeah. So, and you haven't had like a post-workout shake right now. No. Were you just, are you on like a one meal a day type approach or? Um, when I'm training, it's three. When I'm not training, it's two. So I find that, because I'm still, my body weight's still high, um, if I'd go to one meal a day, that meal ends up being just too big. So I like to space it out. I, I like to, uh, I actually love how I feel when I fast. Like if I could just eat one meal a day, I'd be very happy, but try to consume like 2000 calories at a meal. Stuff. Yeah. I feel still bloated. Yeah. I feel terrible. But, and and mm -hmm. I end up eating foods that I shouldn't be eating. Mm -hmm. Um, so I stick with two meals consistently. Um, and sometimes on, on training day, I'll do three cause depending on how I train, cause I know I'm burning more calories. So, uh, and I'm, and I'm trying to lose, uh, tissue. Ultimately I'm trying to lose weight. Uh, fat and, and muscle, but uh, I don't want to, you know, just like starve it off because I know that could be very, very stressful for my body. So I've done some extended fasts, which work great, but um, it's on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, every five to six hours I'm eating. So I'm probably eating at, um, you know, one, two range. Yeah, 12. Well, actually, so I'm eating 12, 4, and 7 usually, so mm -hmm. 12, 3, 30, and 7, so about every three and a half to four hours, but only three times. That's such a good approach. I, I think, um, I mean, you customize everything to what you're doing and in encourage people to do that, but a lot of people fall into this, I'm new to keto or I'm new to this way of eating, I have to do it a certain way, right. one meal a day, what time should I eat, when right. should I do and this? discovering, too, like yeah. I did that with keto, too, right? And I, like I did an extensive keto, um, you know, regimen, and... I didn't know what to do, like, because everyone's like, well, my body works this way, my body works that way. I don't know. So I'm just trying to like, hey, what, what works? How much mm. fat do I really need? Um, what types of fat do I feel better on? And, you know, fasting was the easiest and the mm. best. Like, I mean, if I could just fast all the time, life would be amazing, but yeah. it probably would eventually shrivel up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, learning, man, and uh, not being attached to any stigma, just like track, measure, and try some new stuff. That's kind of what I one of my things is I like to, you know, spit, take 30 days and I'm trying this this month. Let's do this for 30 days, see what happens. And that, that goes with like supplements and diet approaches and training approaches and all kinds always, of different things. Yeah. Meditation, you've yeah. like, Oh yeah. Things like that. Well, yeah. So in the fitness space, you know, a lot of people are taught like after your workout, you have to have a protein shake to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. Yeah. Um, a lot of that the science that I've found is like funded by there could be some industry influence, <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. but it's, but it's hardwired in my head. Like it's, it's indelibly inked in my head. So I still kind of gravitate towards that. Mm -hmm. um, what are I your thoughts? Some, I have some pretty good feedback on that. So one of the biggest mistakes in the fitness industry is shoving food into your mouth after you eat. Well, think about like, especially if you train hard, right? Like it, 
think about the amount of sympathetic arousal you're creating during, during training. Well, what is your body doing? Is your body wanting to digest food at that point? No. Your body's in high sympathetic arousal. So until we bring you down into or increase the parasympathetic tone, um, eating is not a good idea. So I suggest everybody sit down after the do a five-minute meditation, like put your phone away, sit on your butt, breathe, stretch, whatever, whatever it looks like for you to calm down your uh, autonomic nervous system. Uh, and then I suggest typically, you know, if you're trying to lose fat, you don't need to eat. There's no question. But where I do notice a difference is if I'm training hard, if I don't eat right away, my recovery time is longer. So if I'm training hard, I usually will consume something within an hour. Um, and protein, so maybe usually it's just protein. Um, I do notice this, like it's, it's, it's the analogy is the, how big of a hole did you dig, right? Like if you, like if you dig a big hole, fill it. If you just dug a little hole, then don't worry about it. You your body your, will. You fill it in later. Yeah. And then do, do you take into consideration when your next training session would be? Always. Like yeah. if you're not going to train for five days, you're like, well, do I really need to exactly. replenish glycogen? Exactly. Maybe, maybe not. Exactly. And, and you know, how much stress did you create? Because that's another big consideration. How much, how much stress do you have in your life right now? How well did you sleep last night, right? If, you're, if your sympathetic arousal is high, you should probably consider eating something because you're probably in a massive state of elevated cortisol, right? What does it look like? You know, and I think giving people those skill sets, the to have a thought process is, is our greatest uh, advantage in life. It's our you know, greatest opportunity to help is rather than just arbitrarily saying you need to have a post-workout shake or you need to eat breakfast. Well, who and what? And if you're really stressed out, fasting is probably not a good idea for most people, right? If you're, if you're training really hard, fasting is probably not a really good idea because you're creating so much sympathetic stress. You're creating so much cortisol and, and norepinephrine and uh, you need your body to be able to come back down. And food is a good way to do that. You know, carbohydrates can help with that stuff. Uh, food in general helps with that stuff. So, uh, you know, depending on who and what and where and all those awesome scenarios. Uh, it yeah, it, such a great point. You know, but people are just wrapped into the meal prep. I follow this guy. Here's the protocol. Sure. Here's the plan. I think that's the dumbest thing. You know, like if your coach isn't writing your workouts, how the hell can he tell you what to eat? Like, and this is, again, what I teach and people miss. Every workout should have a different stimulus. Not every workout. Um you should be going through phases of a different type of stimulus to your body, right? So, you know, the simplest way to understand it, a strength training stimulus is maybe lower repetition, longer rest periods. A hypertrophy stimulus is maybe we're getting a strength stimulus combined with a metabolic stimulus. So some heavy stuff, some mid-range stuff, and, and trying to accumulate some metabolites. And you have a metabolic stimulus, which is going to be maybe more of a calorically demanding, maybe more of a glycogen burning, uh, just a really dense workout, like not a lot of rest, a lot of movement. Well, think about those. Those are all pretty distinct, and each of them needs a very different energy signature as far as what it's actually burning in the body and what you need to fuel it. So shouldn't your nutrition be different? And if your coach doesn't know what you're doing in the gym, how the hell is he writing or she writing a nutrition program for you? It doesn't make sense. So, again, it's hard because most coaches don't know what the hell they're doing, and, and they're writing programs or nutrition plans based on just like, hey, we're going to just put you in a caloric deficit, and we're going to hope. Well, how, should I be eating more fat or more carb? It matters. Like if you're in a, in a ketosis, ketogenic diet, we know you probably shouldn't be training in a glycolytic energy system, right? Like don't do that stuff if you can do a little bit, but like you do a lot, you're going to feel it really, really fast. So someone training in ketosis, which I don't know if it's a lot of your listeners, but like just, it is a lot, yeah. just take a, lot, a little bit longer between sets. Like when I'm in ketosis, it's usually a strength-based stimulus. Mm -hmm. And I'll often combine non-competing body parts. So like I said, it'll be chest and quads. Mm -hmm so that I'm not accumulating a tremendous amount of lactic acid, right? So I train six to eight repetitions. I walk over something else. So I keep my heart rate elevated, so I'm keeping some, some blood flow, but I'm not really getting at that lactic acid, you know, glycolytic type training. So that's just, you know, oh, and obviously conversely doing some, some low intensity aerobic stuff as well to burn through the, the fat that you've... Uh, Great point. I, if I heard you correctly, so you're giving yourself time. So you do like hamstrings and chest. Yeah. So in between, you're allowing the hamstrings to recover while exactly. you're training the chest. Yeah, so you end chest. up training, training the hamstrings about every two minutes. Like if you know, you're, you're you have about a two minute rest period, but you're not just sitting around doing nothing. So you're still going to get a bit of a metabolic response without getting that massive elevated heart rate, massive elevated cortisol, mm. which ultimately would break down muscle. Right. Yeah. Such a good tip. I think a lot of people, I found that I kind of phase out faster, like peter out, you know, if I'm doing like squats or whatever, no question. It's you, you have to have longer rest or I just yeah. compensate now and just bring carbohydrates. So you can be mostly keto that intra workout carbohydrates. Yeah. Non you, try, you can, I haven't yet. No. I'll give you some today. Okay. It's, it's awesome. So you can is a non insulogenic starch. Uh, I actually find it really, really good for people. I use it in ketosis, um, staying ketosis, so you're not getting insulin spike. Uh, your blood sugar doesn't elevate all that much, and uh, it's really good for performance. 
Um, so yeah, some some think about pre. I have no affiliation with the company. Yeah. Just uh, great product. Right. I think endurance athletes use that a lot too. Yeah, yeah. Um, you mentioned metabolic stress. There's like the physical damage of hypertrophy. If you could pinpoint like one mechanism that, because a lot of people are doing like occlusion training and stuff. Yeah. Is it multiple? Is it that they it has this to network? Be multiple. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's all, so the way I frame it, if you had like um, vol, three volume buttons, right? Like three volume knobs. And, you know, let's say we have one is strength and one is hypertrophy and one is metabolic. And uh, I progressively want to stimulate, let's say, one or maybe two while the other one's turned way down. So I'm slowly turning one or two of them up and, you know, basically increasing the amount of work in those two systems. And I don't touch the other one at all. And so I'm, I'm pushing up the stimulus, pushing up the stimulus, pushing up the volume of that, of that stimulus. Um, and then when I reach a point where I have to subject my body to so much stimulus to get a response that it's going to cause a huge stress response. Well, now I have the opportunity to turn one of those dials way down and then go to the other dial that's been turned off. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So uh, let's say I'm training a, a strength hypertrophy stimulus and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing it for six weeks and really you know, getting better, getting stronger and getting you know, really, really efficient at this hypertrophy stimulus. And I get to the point where now for me to actually get a response, I have to work harder and harder and harder and harder every week. Well, at some point, working hard is going to be overridden by stress. Like working hard is great, but realize the harder you work, the more stress you're creating in your body. So, you know, I call stress kind of the kill switch for muscle, right? It's important to the, to the stimulus and the response, but too much kills your, kills your progress. So um, if you, once you reach a point, it's subjective, but once you reach a point where you feel like, gosh, I have to do a lot of work to get any results, well, gosh, turn one of those down. Let's turn the strength way down, turn it basically off. Or, or you could progress it down slowly and you can go into this other metabolic one, which is just like manipulating the density of your workouts, right? All the while trying to subject your body to the smallest amount of stimulus possible to, to achieve a novel response. So I'm not going to go from zero on, on this volume knob to seven. I'm going to go to from zero to like a half, right? So if I haven't done a metabolic stimulus in the gym in a while, so an example of a metabolic stimulus would just be like, hey, I'm going to do one drop set or I'm going to do one combination of back to back exercises. So now that's increasing the metabolic demand on my body. So my body doesn't have time to rest between sets. So you're accumulating more metabolites. Um, so if I haven't done anything like that, if I've been on exclusively a strength training phase and I just incorporate like one drop set or, um, you know, one superset combination, that's a lot of metabolic stress to my body. My body will respond. Like it's all relative to who you are and sure. how healthy you are. But like ultimately the fitter you are, the more novel the stimulus needs to be. But for average people, like adding in an extra one or two drop sets, that's a good amount of lactic acid. That's a good amount of meta metabolic response. That'll will achieve a new novel stimulus to your body. So manipulate that. Like, hey, I haven't done this in a while. Okay, let's let's do three weeks of this and then move and then let's go to three weeks of like two drop sets or two common, you know, like progressing with an intelligent kind of novel stimulus. So novel stimulus isn't like standing one leg on a BOSU ball, right? <laughs> like a novel stimulus is how do we manipulate these actual variables of exercise, which is just density and volume and load and all these other um, you know, typical exercise variables. Mm. That's a great visual for people those three knobs. I've never heard it articulated in that way, which is awesome. Um, and you kind of said it jokingly, one-legged on a BOSU ball. Um, from the research that I've read, that's just really more activating the core. It's not necessarily good for... You're trying to throw me under the bus, yeah. huh? <laughs> no, it's just what... I mean, you see <laughs> no. people doing a lot no, I of think that. It's, I think it's a waste of time. Yeah. I really do. Um, I don't think there's uh, any value in it unless... So unless there's a, a cross-transfer to your sport, like unless you're trying to stand one leg on a surfboard... It doesn't make any sense. You're not training your stabilizer. You're not training stability. You know, like if you want to train your stabilizer, stand on one leg and have somebody push you a little bit. And have like add some type of rotational force or add some type of force vector that's coming from some direction and stay there and stabilize, right? Or add a dumbbell in your hand. You know, what are you trying to stabilize and, and why are you trying to stabilize it? Because realize it's such a low level contraction if you're standing on a BOSU ball. There's no transfer to anything. And I think it's the most uh, overused. Um, useless effectively uh, method like people standing on wobble boards and stuff and I, th I think you know great awesome but I, I don't see tr especially to people who are trying to improve their physique right like there may be a greater neurological stimulus because your nervous system and your brain are like going crazy maybe if that's what you're after and so if I were to you know objectively think my way through a possible benefit um, I think there would th that additional neurological stimulus to your nervous system and your brain may actually increase your ability to perform or learn new exercises subsequent to that. So it's almost like priming my nervous system, getting it really fired up, and then go subject it to something different, and your brain may be actually wired to learn or maybe wired to be more uh, active. So 
So yeah, you're training your central nervous system or that yeah. novelty pathway. Well, kind it's of kind of like doing, you know, historically people have always done Olympic lifts before they would go do a bodybuilding workout or before they would do a, do a powerlifting workout, right? So you're just amplifying the CNS so mm-hmm. that now I have a better response to this this workout I'm about to do. Hmm. That may I didn't know that. Fit. Was that in like the 70s and 80s or uh, all people have been up, doing it? Yeah, for sure. All oh, through cool. Russia and the East, like they're always doing something explosive, something dynamic, something multi-joint to increase the brain's firing, like activation to the nervous system. So an example would be if you want to try it sometime, like get in a leg press. Um, ideally a leg press that's got a racking mechanism, like two racking mechanisms. So one at the bottom, one at the top, and you would push into it like you're doing an isometronic, pushing into an immovable object as hard as you can for 30 seconds or until that thing falls. Obviously you want a racking mechanism that's not going to fall on you. And all you're doing is you're sending this massive amount of muscular stimulus into the nervous system, or nervous system sending a massive amount of muscular stimulus into the muscular system. Um, and, and turning things on. You're, you're telling your nervous system, like, hey, prepare for exercise, right? Like, you know, it's not a warm up. Warming up my body doesn't prepare me for exercise. I'm preparing my nervous system for what I'm about to subject it to. Hmm. That's awesome. That's a really good tip. I'll have to do that. Um, let's kind of finish up on like periodization. You kind of talked about it a little bit. Some people are, are big on, like you mentioned, you shouldn't always do the same thing every single time. Like, again, just speaking to someone that wants to build muscle, burn sure. fat and so forth. Um, and I know these conversations, you like to d- dive deeper into mindset, spirituality, sure. deeper meaning, but I just want to really oh, cover the tactics. Me, yeah. um, do you think should I like, okay, Mike Mutzel going to the gym wants to build big quads, whatever. Let's just say hypothetically, should I be doing that same workout that we did today? For, if I did that after three weeks, like three I think you could do that exact same workout for two months, exact same exercise with a different objective, right? I don't want you to get stronger. I want you to get better. And there's a big dichotomy there, right? Everyone goes, well, I have to add more load to the bar. No, you don't. Like there's two opportunities for progressive overload. There's maybe more than that, but two main opportunities for progressive overload. I could add more load or I can improve execution. And if you think through that, you could see how improving execution would improve the progressive overload, right? So it's if, I, if I'm going from contracting with, you know, relative poor efficiency of, of using that muscle and I get better and better and better at actually using that muscle and actually making sure it's the primary muscle contracting at every millimeter or every inch of this repetition, that muscle is going to get a lot more direct stimulus. So I think most people, that's why I write six-week primer programs, right? It's effectively just like, hey, get better at this. We're not going to do 13 different exercises. We're going to do probably two, maybe four, but like very few. And, uh, and you know, four over six weeks, right? It's not never going to be four in a workout. Um, two to, you know, two to three exercises per workout, get really, really good at this. And, and really good doesn't just mean, hey, I can do this with well, quote unquote, whatever good form is. It's like, no, how can I objectively improve or increase the amount of work that this muscle is doing? How can I make it harder for this muscle? It's not about completion. It's about challenge. So like we did today for quads. I was like, Mike, stop first, slow down or push into the floor as hard as you can, but don't move. Like I want you to push as hard as you can make those muscles contract. Now use that muscular contraction to propel motion. And that's one of my favorite tips is for anyone who wants to build a body part. If you have a weak body part, stop at the lengthened portion of the range, contract that muscle like you're posing it and use that contraction to now propel motion. So you're making sure that the muscle you're actually trying to train is the thing doing the work rather than your body using whatever it wants, right? Um, it makes things very, very different. And then you know you're actually challenging that muscle. It seems so intuitive and obvious once you articulate it, but before that, people, I mean, it's just, you need it to be heard or expressed in that manner to understand. And I always say, this Man. is so simple. Like muscle building yeah. is very simple. The thing you have to do is forget everything you think you know about exercise and think. Mm-hmm. Like, right, and I say that quote, and like, now you hear it, you're like, yep, that's exactly what I need to do. Because you know it, intuitive, you're like, oh, hell, well, obviously. But nobody's ever phrased it that way, right? Mm-hmm. Nobody ever goes, hey, stop doing what you do and yeah. think. But nobody wants to think. Nobody thinks muscle building is a, you know, an internal meditative experience, ultimately, right? I'm connecting with my body. I'm feeling my body. So many people are using it to disconnect from their body. I think it's your greatest opportunity to connect with your body, man. Like, feel this thing. Like, what's it meant to do? How do I challenge it? How do I make it harder? And most people are spending so much time trying to, you know, show off or trying to complete things. Yeah. They're not worried about actually getting results. And most people don't give a shit about results. They mm. want to say they, they work out, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but if you actually care about results, then yeah. there's there's no other way to train. Like, there's, like I, I, I've never heard anybody say, you know, hard work wins. Like, everyone thinks hard work wins. But if you learn how to train smart first, you'd be like, Oh, like, I, yes, I, I like to train hard, right. but yes, I have to train smart first. And if I can't train smart first, then I won't train hard today. Like if something hurts, hard training doesn't make sense today. 
right? Like, I, let's figure out why, how we can challenge this thing in an intelligent way first, and then and then only then. If I if I feel like, oh, I'm pretty good with this. It feels really good. I'm getting good contraction at every millimeter of this rep or every inch of this rep. Now I can actually increase the amount of challenge to this muscle with load. And there's three things that I, I, I suggest people challenge. Um, and two, before load, I suggest you challenge first time, then distance, and then load. So most people think about, oh, I'm just putting more weight on the bar. Well, have you uh, demonstrated absolute control? And can you increase time first? So how about slowing down? How about increasing the time under tension, the, the amount of uh, time that you're in repetition? Uh, and then we increase distance. And that's what we did there this afternoon or this morning with those um, heel elevations, right? So if you squat normally, we put a little heel elevation. Now you've got three or four inches more of knee distance away from your center of mass. And you can do that with dumbbells. And you can do that with, with shoulder presses or bench presses or whatever, just mm. manipulating distance. And that's something nobody considers. But it's... You know, equal, really effective. Well, equally as effective as adding load, Ex but usually more effective because now I, when I challenge distance, I can challenge the specific muscle. When I challenge load, my body will often adjust my positioning to compensate for that load and actually take the, this load or the tension off the muscle I'm trying to train, right? Again, this is all stuff that I get into, but um, hopefully people can get a bit of an understanding from just talking oh, that's about awesome. it. I think it's great. I mean, it's really... Because so many people are scared to go to the weight room, particularly newbies, women, if they're older, they yeah. haven't been to a gym, yeah. you know, if they haven't played a high school collegiate sport, you know, because in those sports, you're obviously, you're, you know, squatting, cleaning, doing sure. stuff like that. And you become comfortable with sure. gyms, but a lot of people don't grow up with that. So it's uh, having this mindset, I think is key. It's just understanding that it's a different, like you said, it's like a meditative aspect. I mean, you do a lot of yoga as well. Right. And close your eyes, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and I said this to you on one of our yeah. sets, it's like, yeah. close your eyes and, and stop thinking and feel. Like, what is that muscle doing? Is there tension there or where's the tension? Like, do I feel it in my back or do I feel it in my quads? If I don't feel it, I'm in the right place. Well, I'm doing, doing something wrong. Like, what's the compensation? I don't know. Figure it out. Like, contract some stuff, stabilize some stuff, move some stuff around, see what happens. Go slow enough so that you can make those conscious decisions every second. That's a starting foundation, right? Like, and I think women are the best to train because most of them aren't egocentrically attached to the outcome and they'll go nice and slow and they'll feel muscles. I was like, perfect. And oftentimes I tell men, like, train more like a woman. Right? Well, seriously, yeah, right? Like, right. slow down, think. Yeah. Rather than just like, you know, It is an ego thing for men. Yeah, I don't have to grunt my way through it yet. Like, we'll grunt our way through it eventually. Don't worry. Because, mm -hmm. you know, objectively, I want you to grunt your way through something. But I want you to find that one thing that you can just lock in and do naturally and do really, really well. And then we'll lock in on that and we'll grunt through that. But these other exercises you're learning, there's no point in working hard on something you're learning at, right? Do an exercise that you're, or, or pick an exercise that you're learning at, pick a nice lightweight and just learn to contract. Learn to move this muscle through motion with load and tension. Love it. I know you had uh, Steve Weatherford here like a year ago, yeah. a year or two. Yeah, Steve's a good buddy of mine. Yeah, yeah, he's cool. And um, I've seen some of his videos, and so he recommends like doing light band workouts. Like say say today we hit arms. Maybe today's what, Tuesday? Then maybe Friday I would do just like bands for 15, just to burn out the muscle a little bit. Sure. What do you think about that philosophy? I think that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, anytime you can add in a different type of stimulus to the muscle that doesn't create muscle damage but increases blood flow and, and glucose uptake, there's a benefit. Right, so that's kind of the same as BFR, so blood flow restriction. Um, is it going to build huge muscles? Probably not. But is it going to improve glucose uptake and improve blood flow and recovery? Yes. So that, to me, sounds like a brilliant idea. Um, and it doesn't have to be anything specific. It doesn't have to be a lot, right? Like, you know, every day with my kids, we're doing squats, we're doing push-ups, but we make it fun, right? We play the push-up game, right? So we're making it fun. Just like, hey, man, if you guys want to have some ice cream or something, well, let's go play the push-up game for 10 minutes, push-ups or squats, mm -hmm. and they love it. It's a feel like it sounds like I'm a terrible parent. Oh, no, it's awesome. <laughs> they asked me to play, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, so it's ultimately we, we juggle, and if somebody drops the ball, they got to do five push-ups or five squats. And, like, they love it. It's their favorite thing to do. So... Uh, yeah, just learning, uh, teaching your body how to uh, take up greater amount of glucose, which th theoretically will improve performance as well, right? If, if I can improve glucose uptake for the subsequent workout without breaking down muscle, could have a benefit. That's amazing. When did you kind of learn this, that it, that the mechanics matter and stuff like that? Like at what point in your career? I've had every injury under the sun. Um, so it started early, right? It started before I was pro. Uh, I obviously went to school for biomechanics, but I had to unlearn everything I learned in school. Um, I say that kind of jokingly, but also in the truth. Um, but yeah, so 2007, I met this man who ultimately changed my life. And unfortunately, he's, he's left us now, but uh, taught me to, you know, thank goodness he was a bodybuilder because I respected him. Um, uh, but, you know, someone tells you, hey, man, you're doing it wrong, but he mm -hmm. doesn't look like a bodybuilder. You're like, eh. yeah, <laughs> yeah. So uh, he was a bodybuilder. So I, I took, I was a very hard headed kid. So I took what he said and applied it. And uh, his name was Peter Chasson. Um, 
that's when it started. But again, at the same time, it was one of those things where I wish I had listened more. I wish I had been like, stop everything you're doing and take three months to learn this because for the rest of your life, this is going to benefit you. For me, it was more like this five-year drip because I was still attached to the daily outcome, right? Um, so, uh, you know, I'd learn this exercise and then learn exercise and then I still have to work hard every day because I was, you know, ultimately aspiring to be a professional bodybuilder at the time or very soon after a professional bodybuilder. Um, but it's, it's injuries, man. Like when you, when something hurts, if somebody says to you, Hey, do you know, that's not supposed to happen, right? Like that's not part of this. I think that's an important message too, is like injuries are not part of this. Like things aren't supposed to hurt. It's not cause you, that's just how your body works or that's not your genetics. Like, no, that's not supposed to be part of this. You can actually train really, really hard with no joint pain. What? Imagine that. Right. Um, so yeah, that was part of it. It's like elbows and knees and hips and back and all these things hurt. And I was like, wow, how do I train without pain? And, and he ultimately took me under his wing and at least opened me up to the, the reality that this stuff existed. Cause I had no idea. Like I studied in school, man. I knew biomechanics. I knew how muscles work, but I'd never, nobody ever taught me that a bench press wasn't necessarily for your pecs. Like it was forever you want it, for whatever you wanted to train that day. Like if you wanted to make it not a pec exercise, I can show you how to do a bench press. That's not a pec exercise. And people are like, what? Yeah, we can make it a shoulder, a front delt and the tricep exercise. We can even make it a back exercise on a bench press. People are like, what? Yes, it's all in how you manipulate setup and, and your conscious intent, right? Anyways, but so I just became fascinated with it and realized, again, with my obsession with building muscle, I was like, oh, well, this is what I need to build those quote unquote weak body parts that I had. And I put those in, that in quotations because I don't think weak body parts is a real thing. I think it's just a matter of how your body distributes tension. So like you probably would grow up if, if you had just been a squatter and be like, you know, I don't really build quad muscles really well. Well, you build huge glutes and a huge lower back just because you have long femurs. So your brain would go, I'm you know, genetically weak quads. No, you don't. You don't. Like it's exact same musculature as everywhere else in your body, right? It's just like let's figure out how to manipulate your your body so that we can put more tension through our quads and build those. And it's just a manipulation of structure and manipulation of the setup of the exercise. Good good tip. Um, I, I thought you were going to say his name was Greg Kovacs. No. Did you know him? I did. Yeah. yeah. yeah no, Canadian I, bodybuilder. He's Mississauga. I mean, you grew up right in the city. but Yep. Um, yeah, man. Greg, Greg gave me some very nice uh, compliments growing up. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't know him very well, but... Um, you know, for Greg Kovacs to go, holy shit, when I was training legs one time, I was like, all right, that makes me feel pretty good. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, Do you guys train at Olympia Muscle and Fitness? So it was Gold's oh, okay. when, when he was there. But yeah, that's that was the gym. Same that's gym. a gym now, I go now to. Now Olympia Muscle and Fitness. It's yeah. a cool gym. I mean, it got everything you need, really. Well, it's exactly the same as it was in 1994. <laughs> But, some uh, of the some of the dumbbells don't match exactly, uh, but you're like whatever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> some of exactly. those gyms are great. That's yeah. funny. Um, so a few final questions here. Your favorite favorite bodybuilder of all time? Who would it be? Torian Yates. Yeah, and, and luckily he's become a friend now. And uh, that's awesome. Yeah, man. He's. He, I just that was. I literally I, I took pictures of him out of a magazine and put it on the wall in, in my gym, and that was the standard, man. And it was so many levels to why that guy was amazing. Um, so far ahead of his time with his ability to train, right? Like nobody trained like him. And he was the only guy actually, well, not the only guy, but one of the few guys who actually was like intelligently contracting his muscles against load. That's the way I frame it, by the way. It's like, it's not movement, it's contracting muscles against load, right? Mindfully contracting muscles against load. And he was the only guy that did it. Complete control, like, and, and ruthless effort. And just the way his physique looked, like so dense, so hard, so lean, uh, and just the stoic attitude. I was a big fan of him. Um, he was, he was definitely my guy. Yeah, he's awesome. I mean, growing up reading Flex Magazine and Muscular yeah. Development, he was always, was so I think 97, 98, like it was him and Sean Ray back and forth forever in the Mr. Yep. Olympia. Yep. And then I think uh, yep. Nasir El Sambadi was yep. in there some sometime. Yep. He passed away, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, and that's that's one of the things that, the reason I left bodybuilding, man, was like all these guys, these amazing guys who I look up to just kept dropping just like kept flies, dropping, man. man. And, you know, thank goodness I, I've left with great health and mm -hmm. I feel great. And, uh, you know, my internal health is very good. And I was never someone who really pushed the envelope, but it was always in the back of my mind, man. And, you know, I, I actually asked, I think right before I turned pro or right after I turned pro, I asked a couple of pro bodybuilders, man, like, are you ever concerned about your health? And the response I got was very surprising, which is why I don't want to be trans. I want to be transparent about it. Like the, guy, the response I got was like, no, why would I be worried about my health? Like I'm perfectly fine. And the guy who I asked, I'm not going to say who he is, passed away two years later. And, uh, like, I was like, oh, okay. Like, he's like, yeah, I don't know. It was very interesting to me that no bodybuilder would be open about the fact that, like, yeah, man, like, 
you're really big and you're doing some shit that's going to shorten your life if you don't pay attention. I think that's important, man, which is why I like to be the leader in that space. It's like, yes, I did some things that are going to potentially impact my health, but you don't have to kill yourself, man. You don't, you can do it in a healthful way. It's never healthy to be, you know, I was at 321 pounds at one point. It's never healthy to be that big, but, um, it, which is another reason why I stopped. But like the other things that you're doing, don't have to be negatively impactful. Like the things that bodybuilders do are not nearly as uh, detrimental to your health as people think they are, as they're sold in the media as being these negative things that are just going to kill you or you know make you this rageaholic. It's all bullshit, man. It's all the other things that the bodybuilders are doing that are bad. So it's the painkillers because everything's so sore, the joints are killing, right? It's the sleep meds because they're so damn big, they have sleep apnea. That's the stuff that's going to kill them. Or the party drugs because most people who are bodybuilders are very extreme people and they're like, hey man, let's go out and do party drugs in the weekend and like. Mm, you know, I was never into any of that stuff. So mm -hmm. I was very blessed to be able to leave with my health and, uh, you know, my sanity, <laughs> ultimately, for the most part. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, that was uh, that's kind of my experience and how I hope to lead the next generation. That's good. I think it's much needed because now it's, it's so much easier to get steroids on the Internet now. And I think more and more, I mean, I see after doing a post, because I did two cycles in college, mm -hmm. did a post on, on Instagram, got like a bunch of messages from mm -hmm. young men. And looking at their profiles, you would never think they were on gear. And they're like, oh, yeah, I've been running 500 milligrams of test. I don't even come off. And I'm like, you know, they talk about these things. So um, what advice would you have for young men who have done a cycle before or are on in terms of like going to a doctor, maybe getting it prescribed? Because who knows where some of the stuff is made? Yeah, yeah. Um, totally, man. So uh, my first thing is why? You know, always asking yourself why. Is it an insecurity thing? Um, or is it like I want to be a professional bodybuilder, which is very, very different. If it's an insecurity thing, realize steroids aren't going to change you, right? They're not going to build enough muscle to make you, this is me, right? This is my life. They're not going to make you secure. They're not going to make you build enough. There's no amount of muscle that will make you secure. None. Take it from me. 321 pounds, 8% or 8, eight pack, none. Um, so it's not going to make you more secure. It's not going to make you more desirable by the opposite sex. That comes from within, right? So um, first of all, ask yourself why. And if it's just some um, insecurity reasons, like you can do that on your own. Just training alone, knowing you're the type of person who can get shit done, you have the self-discipline to, to do what you say you're going to do, is enough to build your self-confidence, right? Um, you know, people who want to compete, start with your doctor, like for sure. Because and the thing, things, and you know, that's another reason I can stop competing, is like uh, everything on the internet is... Uh, it's junk. Like it's being made in people's bathtubs. It's coming from China with, you know, contaminated with heavy metals. It's not what it says. It is on the label. There's so many issues, man. And I think it's it's really killing a lot of people. So there, there's, you know, not to say the government should make it legal, but it, there would be so many benefits to making it legal and killing less people. And I guarantee less people would do it. Less people would get hurt. More people would get better advice. Now everyone has to sneak around and hide, and they can't share the good advice. And Man, you know, I advise everybody, one, don't do it. Um, and I won't be a hypocrite and say that I haven't. And I won't be a hypocrite to say that I still don't because I still do my, my HRT doses. Mm -hmm. um, but if you don't need it... Don't do it. it, it well, if, if you have good testosterone on your own, that's not going to build as much muscle as you think. Like, you can build a lot of muscle with intelligent training, man. A lot. A lot more than you think. Like, people go, ah, oh, like, 7 to 10 pounds a year. Bullshit. Bullshit. So that that's the hit. This the uh, research, you know, historically, how oh, maximally a human body can build this seven to ten pounds of muscle a day. That's like the Roger Bannister four minute mile, right? Mm -hmm. Like nobody's ever built more than this. Bullshit. Like I see people put on you know ten pounds in four to six weeks if they do things correctly. Um, your body can build muscle really quickly. So who who are those people that they were testing that put on seven to ten pounds in in a, in a year, like? Well, what do their training look like? Were they actually using their muscles or they were just being monkeys and slinging weights? You know, it's a very different thing. So, uh, I mean, you could put on 30 pounds of muscle in a year, I would say, maybe more. Um, I, I would never put a box around yourself like that. But as far as, you know, getting back to that stuff, yeah, man, like, don't use stuff off the internet. Like, you know, no matter what you think it is, it's probably not. And that's why people think the dosages now, like young bodybuilders think that the pro bodybuilders are using these masses, the massive dosages. They're not. Like, if you can't respond to 500 milligrams of test a week, like you said, you're Something's never wrong. Yeah, it's either wrong or you're <laughs> yeah. never going to be a professional bodybuilder. Some people are hyper responders, some people don't respond, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of levels that go into that genetic and, and internal health and, and inflammation and all these other things. But um, like make the most with the least and never, 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 it's never about the dose, man. Like if you can't respond just adding 200 milligrams a week, you're probably not ever going to grow. Like, or fix your health first, right? So that's the thing. People are always going, they're always chasing hormones. Well, before thyroid, before, um, you know, estrogen or testosterone are really function, uh, 
beneficial to you, you have to improve thyroid, you have to improve adrenals, you have to improve HP axis and, and, and GI stress and inflammation, all these things like all those things work in, in unison, right? Like it can't be, it's not all separate systems. They all work together. Such a good point. And it, what do you think about all these HRT clinics? I mean, not totally changing the topic, but they're popping up and they're just giving men just cookie cutter doses. Oh yeah, it's Dude, 100 it's, milligrams a week. It's terrible, right? We, yeah. yeah, we talk about it and, and uh, you know, even just with HCG and people thinking HCG is useful and uh, I've never seen any data that says it does anything. And then most people I talk to, it's just absolutely useless unless you're trying to get somebody pregnant. Um, yeah, it, it's, I mean, it's a money maker, right? They make really good money. You get a thousand people on auto bill for a hundred bucks, bucks a month. Yeah, yeah, right. bucks, yeah, right. Some, yeah, yeah, it's crazy. So, yeah, that's all it is. I, I get it. Um, and I'm against it, but, uh, you know, it, it is what it is. I think no question that a lot of men, especially men 35 plus can benefit from testosterone. Mm -hmm. Like no question your, your uh, vitality is better. Your sex life is better. Like. I'd rather live a life where I feel awesome, but that's only for guys who are the testosterone is in the tank, right? If you're someone who's healthy, if you're lean, your testosterone is not going to be in the tank. Testosterone is not this panacea, right? Get off your ass, do some exercise, go for a walk every day. That's going to do more for your testosterone than anything. Get some, get some light, you know, get some sunshine, get some, get a little bit of exercise, get some intense exercise, you know, stop eating junk food, stop eating pesticides, stop eating estrogen. Like, Yes, those are the things we want, we want to get these people doing, man. Like, so I'm giving away, I haven't given away yet, but giving away my first 30 days of coaching to everybody. I'm like, here, this, awesome. is, this is what I tell everybody yeah. the first 30 days. The reason is it's because it's simple. It's like more of an elimination diet, right? Get rid of the toxic burden in your body. Get rid of the, the pesticides. Get rid of the estrogens. Get rid of anything that's going to be causing stress to your body. And then walk every day, right? How about that? Like, let's do that. If you can't commit to that, you're not going to change your body. Like, that's the simplicity of it. Walk and breathe, man. Those are the two most primal things we do, right? The two most um, kind of instinctive movement patterns we have. We have to think about walking and breathing. If you're not doing those correctly or, or at least often, <laughs> like intentionally, what, what likelihood do you have of ever changing your body, right? It's almost impossible. Such a good point. And, and you bring me back to the training session. Like, I've been taught to brace, like, just all... Uh, oral breathing and you were like Mike breathe through your nose breathe through your nose that was a really good cue and I think a lot of people because we see the big power lifters on you know Lane Norton or whoever squatting six some hundred pounds and we see how they brace and so we do that as people who are trying to for learn for a single rep maybe different than, than a multiple rep set okay. right like so one thing I'm playing with that you may enjoy is one breath three reps so really trying to extend that inhalation exhalation sequence so like like really mm -hmm. getting like a you know 20 to 30 second inhalation 20 to 30 second exhalation while you're going really methodically and slowly through your reps so your perceived exertion on those reps is much less um just an interesting thing and it doesn't even have to be this this massive diaphragmatic breath where your belly is really expanding because you can still maintain relative brace in your abs while getting a good deep inhalation right so you know letting your back expand a little bit um is yeah, it's, I mean, the performance benefits are significant. And then especially after the set too, if people aren't nasal breathing, start. Mm -hmm. It's like extended nasal uh, exhalations will bring down your heart rate almost immediately, right? So getting that HRV, um, bringing down the parasympathetic, or that sympathetic, increasing the parasympathetic tone. Yeah, yeah. Are you doing mouth taping at night, personally? I don't, I, I did for a while, but I, I, I find that I don't need to. No, yeah. I found that it worked, but I found now since I did it for like, I'll do it probably about a week of every month. Mm -hmm. I find my, I, I don't snore. So yeah. I'm finding my mouth stays closed. Yeah. If I notice for a couple of days in a row where I'm snoring or I wake up not, uh, not rested, then I'll put it back on. I've mm -hmm. got them in the, in the nightstand. Yeah, so yeah. I put it on my kids too, man. It was my kids nice. are mouth breathing sometime and they're mm -hmm. all very lean, very healthy. Uh, so just, you know, who knows why it is, right? Yeah. I think part of it is, yeah, just our culture, you know, maybe how long they were breastfed or whatever. My daughter was breastfed for like nine months and I still see her sometimes just sleeping and mouth is wide open and sometimes she'll sleep with us and she's kicking and turning and I'm like, Nez, if you're in the bed with us now, you have to mouth tape and she's cool with it because she sees mom and dad do it. I just do it because... Every night? I do, yeah, it's just like a habit. Yeah. You know, I just have my little travel packets over there. So I have like, a, you know, a balloons for some PRI stuff. I have like a little headlamp with red light, you know, at night. So in the hotel room, I'm not turning on these bright fluorescent lights. So, <laughs> you know, traveling all the time, you have to have work Dude, I'm watching your Instagram story for it's pretty sure. Funny. <laughs> <laughs> pretty funny. Um, so speaking of that, we have a few kind of parting questions yeah. we ask every guest on the show, Ben. Uh, your morning routine. We know successful people, business owners, influencers like yourself yeah. have a set of things they do in the morning. No question, man. Uh, first thing I do every morning is before, I even open my eyes it's gratitude and I uh, try to do at least three minutes and sometimes it's longer and it starts with the people laying beside me and it starts with the, the uh, things around me in my house my my you know everything in my life and, and extends out in this this kind of 
uh, perpetual circle to the people and uh, the things that I've got to experience and, and just the simple things that people sometimes take for granted, like the electricity and the water and the places we live. And, um, you know, for me, the primarily, it, primarily it's, it's about being grateful for the people in my life because I'm pretty darn blessed. I, v- I really am. Um, you know, from there, I actually floss my teeth and I brush as soon as I get up. Those are my two things that I just think it's important. I put place high value on dental health, and, and I think there's there's probably good reason research. for that now. Yeah. Uh, and then it's meditation sessions. So I'll usually do, I'll do at least 10 minutes, and I'll try to do at least 30, th- 10 to 30 minutes, and sometimes up to an hour, um, sometimes guided, sometimes not. Um, and that that's the set. Like, those are every day. After that, some days it's yoga, some days it's training, uh, some days it's reading, some days it's journaling. So those things are my kind of set. But usually right after that, it's um, something that's going to be physical. So maybe a, an hour walk outside, maybe an hour yoga, maybe an hour in the gym. Um, so kind of anchoring all my, my bases, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, you know, from there, I'm going to try to usually get some work done. So. Yeah, get some. Now, um, you're getting up early. You said like 5 a.m.? 4.30, 4.30. And do you feel like you naturally wake up at that time, or you just do it to fit everything in with the kids? I, I feel yeah. both. Like so, I go to bed early now, right? I feel way better if I wake up at four four thirty, um, and I go to bed at nine. So, I, so I'm in bed by nine. I mm-hmm. sometimes read, I sometimes hang with the kids, whatever it is, um, and then up by four four thirty. And I, I feel great. I don't use an alarm. That's when I wake up. Like it's nice. four, it's four twenty seven, like clockwork most days. Wow. Uh, four fourteen, four twenty seven. <laughs> That's just what it happens. Um, but yeah, I like the idea of getting kind of four hours of, of stuff in before anybody's awake. And then it really allows me to feel uh, free in the evening. So when I get home after like six, there's no phone, there's no computer, there's no, it's just kid time. Um, so, you know, we have dinner at six every night and then it's, what do you guys want to do? Now, unfortunately, it's winter time, so there's not much sun out. But in the summertime, it's, you know, it's light till nine, ten o'clock. So we're outside playing, walking, running, like having fun. But um, yeah, that's that's the typical day that makes so much sense i mean it, it the family life is so much more uh rewarding when there's no phone or computer like you feel so guilty when you're like oh i just gotta send one more email and it's like 20 minutes and and the you know your kids get kind of mad at you and they right. act differently i don't even worry about them being mad. you're right they do yeah. they do notice but i don't even worry about them and i worry about like what are they perceiving like who's more important is that person more important than me like that's big to me, man. Like you know, like oh wait, just just wait a minute. I've got something else to do that's more important than me now, Dad. Like that's what the kids framing in their mind, right? I believe. Uh, and also, what what kind of example are you setting for them, right? Like what's going to happen when they get their own phone, right? How much attention are you going to get? And that's so. Again, we're all guilty of it at some level, but um, I'm doing my best to not uh, make it a part of our evening life. So like I, I set it off after 7 p.m. But usually I try to put it down at six. Mm, that's key. I think a lot of parents need to do that, you know. And sadly, you know, um, when I go to the gym or I'm out in public and I see parents are always on their phone. Like, I think this is not. They I think it's get it, man. So, so yeah. parents, and, and, you know, I don't throw anybody on the bus, but, like, there's a lot of people who just don't get uh, repercussions for their actions. Like, you know, cause and effect, right? <laughs> Uh, like I do this, this happens. Like, people just don't see that, and I see. I'm very aware of like when I say this, what is their perception of it? What? Because like just because I say something doesn't necessarily mean that's how they take it. I may say it to mean it one way, they could take it to mean something else. They could perceive something for me that I'm not thinking in any way. So you have to be aware of like how is this impacting those little humans, you know? And uh, yeah, just like everything I say, they're interpreting, right? They're little meaning making machines, man. Like, oh, why do you say that? You know, they may or may not be doing it consciously, but it's it's certainly programming their unconscious mind, man. That's what that book was that I gave you. Um, talking about just like subconscious governs our beliefs, it governs our life. And if you can't uh, at least have some conscious control over your subconscious at some point in your life, you're going to have a hard time living the life you want. Mm-hmm. It's such a good point. I mean... As parents, invariably, we're going to screw them up somehow. Oh, for sure. You know, well, and we want to I, I, minimize. I don't know that I want to agree with that. Like, you think so? I, I, well, no, I do agree with yeah. it, it, like, in principle. But at the same time, I don't want to accept it, right? Yeah. I'm like, no, well, why can't I be so conscious of it that I don't have to screw them up? Like, I want them to be amazing. That's why I think, you know, sometimes you can make mistakes. But if you're conscious of your mistakes, like, you set them down and go, hey, kids, come here. Like, I'm sorry. Like, I know I didn't give you my attention, um, but now I'm going to give you my full attention because you're the most important thing to me. Like, because there's going to be times where you screw up. But again, owning that and going, hey, guys, I screwed up. I'm sorry. It allows them to now, like, when they screw up, they can go, hey, Dad, you know, I screwed up. You're just giving them that 
you know, with that uh, ability to own their life. Yeah, man, let them know that you're, you're, especially us, you know, let them know you're real, let them know you're vulnerable, let them know how you react when you make a mistake. Like, do you get angry and go, oh, leave me alone? No, like, hey, guys, I apologize. I think that's important, man. So I don't think we should accept the fact that we're going to screw them up. I know I've heard that and I've said mm-hmm. that myself, but just you saying that, I was like, oh, man. Like, no, I, I yeah. like that. It doesn't have yeah. to be. You're right. That is a good perspective. Um, but it's funny, I mean, how much attention we did or didn't get or the way that it was said and how sure. we internalize that in 40, 50 years down the line. It's so, like, we're so yeah. impressionable at that it, age. It would be very cool if someone could start to quantify our subconscious or, you know, like, write everything down. Like, all my beliefs, at some point, I'm sure they'll be able to do it. Like, here's all your beliefs on a, on a whiteboard. Like, oh, cool, let's get rid of that one, you know, like, because ultimately, there's a lot of stuff that's buried that we're not even aware of that's guiding our, like we talked about this morning, man, it's guiding our internal self-talk. It's guiding our talk about other people. It's guiding our life. And if we can't begin to be aware of it, we can't change it. So this is kind of where I'm in my life right now is like questioning everything, questioning all my beliefs, every word that comes out of my mouth. I don't know where I read it, but I read it somewhere recently that said like, your thoughts are not your thoughts. And I was like, well, what was that? And it's the idea that well, most thoughts you're having are probably thoughts that someone else has had that you've read somewhere or you've heard somewhere. It's just some like little manipulation of those thoughts. And uh, well, that's, that's interesting, right? So how much other people are impacting you and, and how much your beliefs are impacting what you're saying and what you're thinking is, Man, this is talk about rabbit hole, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's one of those things you want to meditate on it for three weeks and, and not come out of the black room. Well, it's key. I think everyone needs to be aware of it. And even just like how, not to deviate too much, but like how food is packaged, whether it says gluten-free, paleo, or healthy, that, <laughs> sure. that will determine how much we eat. Sure. So it's all unconscious. There's so many different yeah. factors that go into our actions, what we say, what yeah. we eat, who we eat with, all this stuff, which is crazy. Um, yeah. There's. A, I'll just throw one more yeah. thing in there. There's a guy who trains here. He's a good friend of mine who... Uh, talks about covert influence, like ultimately influencing your unconscious and how they do it intentionally on the television or how they do it intentionally in the media. And so interesting to know how much we're just effed with, man. Like we're so manipulated and we're just puppets. Mm-hmm. All at the end of the day, we're, we're ultimately just, you know, overgrown monkeys who are standing upright and, and they're just manipulating the hell out of us. And, and they know exactly what they're doing. Uh, and they're doing it on purpose to sell more things, to drive more industry, to make more money. It's so interesting, man, that, um, you know, people know how to manipulate it and, if we don't become conscious of it, we're just ultimately puppets. Do you think that's why drugs, psychedelics, mushrooms, LSD, and all that is illegal? Because part of you know doing those sort, sort of, what do you call them, plant-based medicines, yeah. whatever, kind of opens your mind up to newer opportunities and being more connected. Do you think that's why? Uh, yeah, I mean, who, who knows if it, that's why it's illegal, but that's certainly what it seems to be doing, right? Is it For me, it was um, just allowing you to lose the the necessity of all the material things, right? You're like, oh, those things are just not so important anymore. And I think the government fears that. And I'm sure they knew that, right? Like, God, these people aren't valuing, like, the typical material goods. They don't want to buy this stuff anymore. These people want to go and, like, be hippies and be farmers, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I'm sure, I don't know what the industry looked like in the 70s, but I'm sure it was, I'm sure it suffered. People are like, hey, man, we just want to, like, wear, like, wear normal clothes and we want to love each other and, like, oh, well, we don't want that. We want these people to be fear-based. We want these people to be angry. We want these people to need things, not be feel like they're actually fulfilled <laughs> inside. God, we don't want that. So let's right. get this all this stuff illegal. This stuff is really bad for you. It's frying your brain. Oh, don't ever do that, kids. Okay, well, maybe. Like, I don't want to speculate why it's illegal, but it seems to make a lot of sense, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of interesting now that, you know, Johns Hopkins and other universities, I think Oregon is making a big push to make medicinal mushrooms, psychedelic mushrooms legal, at least kind of like as a schedule two. I, I can't remember the, the type of, of class, but under a doctor prescription, like super, like marijuana used to be in California like yeah. four years ago. So it'll be interesting to see where mm-hmm. that kind of goes. Um, getting back a little bit to the second final question, if there's just one herb, nutrient, supplement, whole food. Like you're stranded on a desert island, vitamin D, omega threes, fish is covered. What's coming with you? Oh, one thing, huh? Oh, you hinted that you love blueberries. And you have I was, that's the first thing that came to mind. <laughs> yeah. I was like, blueberries would be a good one. Um, hmm. Yeah. Well, it depends. Am I am I am I at all concerned about my health and longevity? So. Probably almond butter, man. Mm, like, I just love it. <laughs> Trevor, my, my butt man is just laughing over there. <laughs> well, that's my that's my kill. Your it's, my, yeah. it's my weakness. It's my it's how I always choose to to cheat, right? Indulge. Like, yeah, um, I don't like junk food anymore, man. But like, if I can eat some some almond butter, that makes me pretty happy. Yeah, um, it's dangerous too, right? I mean, uh, I can crush a whole jar. Right. <laughs> that's what we talk about. So, 
when Ben needs yeah. a snack, so that, that, that's what I was saying. When I, yeah. when I, I mean, if I fast for the whole day, I'll go home and you know, I'll have a good, huge plate of vegetables and a little portion of meat and a good, por- you know, some fresh olive oil and some avocado on it. And that's the meal. And then I'm like, oh, I still need to have like another thousand calories. And you're like, okay, well, let's have a little almond butter. Well, let's have a whole jar of almond butter every day. <laughs> you know, like that's ultimately what it turns into because it's so easy to eat because, you know, they're, they're all packed down, like ultimately three tablespoons, depending on how big the tablespoon is, right? You're like, oh, so yeah, I mean, there's something in there. You know, blueberries would certainly be it. I actually frame all my diet around six simple foods. I can tell everybody for, for uh, understanding's sake, uh, wild meat. So everything I, I eat is ideally wild. I eat a little bit of grass-fed beef, but not all that often. Uh, I eat uh, green vegetables, every type of green vegetable I can. I eat lots of vegetables. Um, blueberries, as I said, and maybe other types of berries too, but typically blueberries. Uh, olive oil, avocado, and cacao. Those are, those are the primary six uh, foods that I eat. Um, that's it. Like, you know, every, let's say 90% of my calories is coming from that, and, and occasionally I'll add in other stuff like sweet potatoes or yucca and... Um, that's really it. Mm-hmm. Maybe some macadamias. Yeah, I love that you threw cacao in that mix because uh, it's more dark chocolate. I mean, interesting. When I was bike racing a lot, I would have like a, a really dense, uh, high high cocoa polyphenol. I can't remember. It was like super bitter, but that would increase. It was like almost like a pre workout, like an NO explode or yeah, one of those things. Yeah, like it was sure. amazing the vasodilatory effects yeah. of that. Um, all right, so what do you think, like, if you were to have a conversation with a politician, like, in an elevator and stuff, and they, they said, Ben, you've interviewed all these people on, this, on your podcast, you know, all throughout the world, what's the biggest health challenge that we're facing now, and, and like, what could we actually do about it, like, on a societal level? Like, what would you want a, a politician or a, a policymaker to know? Well, I'll tell you, I had a good conversation with Arnold about this. As uh, you know, Arnold has the, the Arnold Encyclopedia of Modern Bodybuilding, and I think every man, you know, under the age of 50 has read that thing. Um, and, I, and I like the idea of rewriting. This is obviously not exactly what I would say to any politician, but what I said to Arnold was I like the idea of rewriting that and actually putting some intelligent muscle building information in there. Like, imagine empowering every boy and girl at 13 or 14 years old with the, the knowledge and the skill to build your greatest body, uh, how you would shift the course of the world. And like, no more eating disorders, hypothetically, or much fewer, um, potentially less bullying and angry kids because they're more secure in themselves, they feel more, feel more empowered, um, you know, potentially less obesity, People just feel like they can actually build their body and actually have control over their body. So maybe people just are healthy and maybe it helps the, the healthcare system a little bit. Yeah. So I actually pitched it to him. I was like, hey, man, I'll do it. It's mm-hmm. just going to take time. And he was all about it. But he's like, we'll get it done. So it's one of these things where if any of the listeners wants to do it, like jump on it, it'll help you. It's just management and time, right? If I if I had financing and I'd do it and we'd, you know, with his help, and I'm sure The Rock would get behind it, we'd be in every high school in the world, at least in, in America, and make that kind of part, part of the curriculum because... Um, I, you know, ultimately it's the blueprint for your body. Like imagine at 13 years old when you started becoming aware that you had a body, um, somebody goes, hey man, here's a blueprint for you. And mm-hmm. it's not just like, hey, you need to do a bench press. It's like, hey man, like, no, this is how muscles work. And in the most primitive way written for, you know, 13, 14 year old crowd, like you should do this. And if you want to train this thing and not every kid's get a reader or you make it part of the curriculum, but, uh, you know, giving them a blueprint for their body, I think, would empower a lot of people to avoid a lot of problems. And, you know, that's an answer that kind of fits into my paradigm and uh, something that I'd like to do. It may not be the best answer for changing the world or changing no, the health care, but I think it, uh, it could definitely change a lot of people's, especially young boys, man. We're so insecure and, uh, you know, need a lot of direction and help. And, uh, you know, thank goodness it seems like there's a lot more great men coming out now to be able to lead people. But... Uh, still, like, there's always there's always a shortage of, of guys who actually care enough to make a difference. It's a great point, and I think most physical fitness programs, like in schools at least, it's very like trying to fit like a, a square peg into a round totally. hole for a lot of people. Yeah. and then they you think, get well, it, right? Because they yeah. you get this many people, and you have this much time, and like a huge amount of people, small amount of time, and you're trying to like you need to learn how to get fit. Well, what's the easiest way to do it? It's like physical therapy, right? It's like everyone needs a protocol. Like everyone needs you need to squat, deadlift, bench press, go. Everybody is the same. If you're not touching your chest, you're failing. If you're not touching the floor, you're doing it wrong. Well, no, like that doesn't make sense, right? You have to run a sub six mile right. where you're not fit. 30 right. pull-ups. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Climb the rope in gym class or you fail. Right, right. Yeah. That's funny. Ben Pekulski, really appreciate you coming on the show. But Thanks, uh, folks are listening or watching still on, on YouTube. There's a few channels. I mean, you're big on Instagram. BPACFitness.com? Yeah. Yeah. BPACFitness. And then uh, MI40 on Nation. YouTube. Yeah. Uh, YouTube is MI40. Yep. Okay. Uh, MI40. Me, uh, MI stands for muscle intelligence. 40. Everything was based around 40 day programs and 40 minute workouts. Uh, just the idea of ultimate efficiency. Um, muscle Expert Podcast on iTunes. And we got some pretty awesome guests, yourself included. 
Um, and that, well, as I mentioned, hypertrophy mastery, which yeah, that'd be a good one. I'll yeah, definitely people, put that in the show notes for yeah, sure. People check that out. Uh, it's great, man. It's four months, and at the end of it, you've kind of mastered every body part, or at least very close to it. And at the very least, we're we're becoming the catalyst for intelligent muscle building around the world, right? Like it seems like the the movement is happening, and. You know, going back to 2011, I thought I was the only person in the world who thought this way, or maybe one of like 10. <laughs> uh, there wasn't very many, at least not that were, you know, had a platform. Uh, but now it seems like everybody's kind of moving their way toward like, hey, actually, you should do some stuff that's that's intelligently thought out rather than just swinging weight like monkeys. So, yeah, um, yeah and, awesome. then, and my 40 Nation is my member site. That's cool. And then the uh, the courses for, uh, do you have to be a trainer to do the courses? Oh, absolutely not. No, okay. Absolutely not. So. Uh, it's really anybody who values their time and their fitness, man. Like, it's not even made for for trainers. Although it probably is the best thing for trainers, it's not guided at trainers at all. It's it's literally directed at anyone who wants to understand the basics. It's very entry level, but at the same time, you know, most of the people that come are trainers. Or not, I don't want to say most, but a lot of people that come are trainers because when you take a training certification, they're teaching you tactics, right? They're teaching you manipulation of sets and reps and volume and all these things. But nobody ever teaches this foundational principle like, hey, for any of those things to actually matter, you got to do this first. Nobody teaches that. Uh, not at nobody. Uh, RTS, if you guys want to take a great certification that blows mine away, RTS, uh, RTS123.com, which is a resistance training specialist. The creator is Tom Purvis. He's one of my mentors. He's one of the most brilliant guys I know. Take that course if you guys like this information. Uh, blow your mind uh, he's in Oklahoma he does them all over the country all over the world uh, Tom is by far the brightest guy I've ever met when it comes to biomechanics of exercise he's been the greatest influence on me uh, and understand just challenging my, my my thought process you know like you, you believe you think you know something right until you talk to a guy like that you're like oh yeah we, uh, you know the more we learn the less we know kind of scenario right that's awesome yeah. I'll definitely check that out RTS so he's in Tulsa or something like that, but he he's goes all in, over the place. Uh, City, I think. Uh huh. Yeah. And then the courses that you offer is that like once a month on a weekend or? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's exactly. It. So next year, I think in 2019, we're going to about every other month. Um, for so we're doing two levels. So we're doing uh, the entry level, which is like level one, every other month. So it'll be, I believe, February, April. Actually, it's February, March, May. But you guys can check out the calendar. It's mi40gym.com. Um, and, uh, and then we're doing a level two, which is going to be back to back with a, uh, like a hypertrophy camp. And I'll tell you what that means. So level two is a higher level. You have to have done level one first, which is then getting into the tactics of, of matching this, uh, you know, the strength, the hypertrophy and the metabolic stimulus with your nutrition. Like, well, how do you do that? That, that type of stuff and, and how to manipulate the stimulus of an exercise and progress it. Um, and then after the three day hypertrophy camp is just like three days of the hardest workouts of your life, like implementing all the stuff you learned in level one and two, just train tw two workouts a day, really, really hard, just soul crushing type workouts. That's cool. Um, but in an intelligent way, right? Yeah, it's never going to be something that's going to hurt you. It's always done in a safe way, yeah. but ultimately trying to help people you know, understand because there's, there's ultimately two facets, right? You have to master skill and then you have to master effort. And, uh, so once we've taught you how to master the skill and then we teach you how to master the effort. That's cool. Yeah, I'll definitely, I would like to, I don't know when I'll be out in Florida again, but I would love to do that. Cool. Bring my wife along and stuff like that. Yeah. So, uh, Ben, really appreciate your time. Thanks, appreciate Mike. the opportunity. We had a great training session. Really appreciate all you guys that are still here. So if you're still here, please hit that like button. Share this with someone that you care about, that cares about fitness, learning how to move their body in an, an intelligent way. Please go follow Ben over on Instagram and on YouTube as well. And we'll catch you in the next video. Peace.